Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our first issue briefing of the eighth Summit on the Global Agenda. Very delighted that you'll be joining us. I'd also like to warm, uh, warmly welcome our audience watching us live on weforum.org. This is the first of a, of a packed schedule this afternoon of issue briefings. The purpose of these, of course, is to bring some of the expertise, knowledge, and um, frankly, intellectual brilliance of the people gathered here in Abu Dhabi and put them in, uh, in, in the space here in the Media Briefing Center where we can pose them questions and hopefully elicit some interesting responses on some of the critical cutting issues and challenges of the day. We're going to take a, a, a time-honored uh, path here. We'll invite our, column, uh, our panelists here to say a few words. There will also be time for questions from the floor. We've also had questions coming in from social media this morning, so we have a, a list here to uh, keep us entertained for the next half hour. I'm going to um, waste no more time, frankly, because we haven't, haven't got a lot of it and we've got a lot of things to talk about. So first of all, I'd love to introduce my first panelist, Hassan Hasbani, Chief Executive Officer of Greycoats, Lebanon. Hassan, I'm going to ask you just to give us a bit of a brief overview on prospects for the region. Well, basically, let's think of the region as three sub-regions. Uh, you've got the uh, GCC uh, part of it, you've got the North African Arab world, and the Eastern Mediterranean uh, part, or the Levant part. Uh, if we look at the prospects for uh, this part, the GCC, where we are right now today, uh, given the lower oil prices uh, and uh, the, the current uh, global uh, situation, um, this is the uh, great incentive for this part of the world to start focusing and putting a higher priority on diversifying the economies. Because as long as oil prices are high, you know, there's a lot of talk about economic diversification but uh, very uh, kind of timid action. While right now, it's a great opportunity to put this at the top of the uh, agenda. Uh, let's uh, not forget that the growth is still uh, in the vicinity of 3, 3.6% 3 uh, uh, on a GDP level, uh, kind of aggregated across the GCC uh, region, which compared to the situation around the world is still a fairly good uh, growth. Uh, reform is taking place around uh, governance, uh, around encouraging investments in the private sector, small medium enterprises, and encouraging foreign direct investments. All of this will also be supported and helped by lower oil prices to prioritize. The North African part of this world also sits on <coughs> good significant reserves of oil and gas and uh, has a good potential when and if oil prices go up. Also, the reforms that have taken place after post-revolutions uh, are starting to show effect and uh, results. So uh, I would say they're not at an advanced level of reform, but uh, at the starting point of structural reforms, economic, political, and, and social, which will create ample opportunity for investments and growth in the future, not forgetting the significant growth in the population in that part of the world, particularly on the youth uh, side. Uh, in the Levant, uh, again, the recent discoveries of uh, gas in the Eastern Mediterranean, coupled with a high level of mathematical and scientific education uh, quality, as per the competitiveness, uh, global competitiveness ranking, uh, for example, Lebanon ranks number five in the world in terms of mathematical and scientific education. So that part of the world tends to be effectively the main supply of talent and capabilities for the region. It is still going through a major turmoil, particularly the conflict in Syria, which will take a bit of time. But again, post-conflict and once stability starts coming back uh, uh, on the governance structure and the reforms that could take place in that part, uh, midterm, the prospects are quite significant in terms of rebuilding the infrastructure in terms of developing the private sector, and in terms of readiness for these markets to open for foreign direct investments through liberalization, which had already started pre-conflict, but was kind of stopped due to the instability that was created. It will come back to the picture later on. Lots of issues there we'll come back to. First of all, let's go to our second guest, Azita Berar Awad. <coughs> You're the Director of Employment Policy International Labour organization in Geneva, and you're a member of our Meta Council on Inclusive Growth. Now, of course, we've just published a report, forgive the, uh, the, the plug, on inclusive growth. It's not about growth, it's about the right kind of growth. Has this region got the message? 
I think that we want to focus on some of the structural issues that have been there uh, at a time the growth was higher and including now it, it, should, it should be on top of the policy agenda. And I would like to, to mention three trends um, that are very important. Even though before this recent uh, wave of global economic slowdown and the regional factors that were mentioned a while ago, while the growth is still good, but not as good as it used to be, this is the type of growth that has not been generating jobs, not enough jobs, and not enough jobs of good quality. Youth unemployment is the highest in this region. We just uh, released two weeks ago our latest global employment trends um, for the world. And we found out that while globally unemployment has come among youth, has come slightly down compared to where it used to be at the peak of the crisis, in this region, North Africa and Middle East, it has gone up. So that is a tremendous uh, increase. And it is year after year in our reports, highest among all regions. So what we want to focus on is that the same level of growth uh, can generate different results. It has to do with the patterns of growth, but it, is, it has to do with also how do you use the benefits of growth. So it is a question of really focusing on job creating policy, policies that uh, support transformation of the economy, structural change, investment in job creating, but also uh, that's another angle that I want to emphasize, uh, the quality of jobs uh, from a social protection point of view. Again, it's a region that has the means to do more on social protection, whether we are talking about, um, you know, compensation to labor, whether we are talking about access to health insurance, whether we are talking about uh, pensions. Uh, again, let me give another figure. Uh, two thirds of those who are working um, do not have access to health insurance or pension system. So the question here is, um, this, we should not be focusing on these issues because they are good for inclusive societies, but these hamper contribution to further growth. So investing in social protection, investing in job creation is good for growth. So the, the dichotomy that growth should come first and then we distribute is not there. So I would really say that the two aspects of job creation in particular for you know, tackling these structural issues of high youth unemployment, or let me put it, uh, vulnerable employment, uh, is, is very important. And the second thing is that a virtuous cycle of uh, investing in social transfers and social protection is within the means of this region. Thank you. And again, let's come back to that. But first, let's, uh, let's talk to our third guest here, Mohammed al -Assis, Associate Dean. The School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, the American University in Cairo. We just heard about youth unemployment. We've heard some optimistic mm -hmm. views on the p prospects of the region. But what can we do about it? What can we? What can we? What have you seen recently that that gives you some idea that we could actually have a, a rosier, brighter future for, for the unemployment? So, youth unemployment um, for the region is not a business cycle issue. It's very important to understand what it is. It's a structural. Um, disconnect between um, the educational system and uh, the economy and where the economy is headed. Resolving it doesn't happen on the margin and on the side of growth. Resolving it needs a serious focus in building your growth agenda to address these issues. Um, so the region uh, happens to have uh, the biggest uh, percent of youth uh, uh, in the world. 75% of Arabs are below 30 years old. A um, few years ago here at, uh, at, at the WEF, we talked about the golden number of 100 million jobs that need to be created over the next 10 years to keep this very high unemployment level from even going higher. And you know, from what we just heard, we're not doing a great job there. So 
what we need to do is, number one, we need to stop thinking about it as a business cycle issue that we must resolve through short-term solutions, and we need to start thinking about what it takes to resolve it. Our educational system here in the region needs to be revamped completely. Um, um, uh, some of the countries in this region are performing among the worst worldwide when it comes to elementary education. Uh, there are smart interventions uh, using uh, modern technology such as massive open online uh, courses, um, the Queen Rania, uh, Rania of Jordan's uh, Idraq initiative to try to uh, utilize modern technology to bring education to the forefront of, of uh, youth in the region is a good example. We need more of that and we need more of that targeted at elementary levels and at, 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 young, uh, at young age uh, uh, for these youth. We need to uh, uh, reconsider how our access to finance is done in the region to lower the barriers to entry to allow more of these youth who have creative ideas for entrepreneurship to be able to access this, um, uh, this financing uh, opportunities to grow their businesses, develop it, and make the most out of it. We need to reconsider how property rights are distributed in the region to protect these most um, uh, at risk uh, when it comes to uh, employment, uh, to protect their, uh, their, their investments. Uh, we need to uh, uh, rethink how the interaction between the informal sector, which is which is massive. It's not. It's not a minor economy. It's uh, some measures put uh, put it at in, in some of the biggest countries of of uh, Egypt, uh, uh, in addition to Libya and Tunisia, at uh, roughly 85 percent of entrepreneurs are functioning extra legally beyond any uh, legal registration or protection. Therefore, they don't have access to capital. They can't grow. They're stuck in this loop. So, we require a whole structural reformulation of how we approach our growth agenda. Let's not forget that some of these countries in the region, Egypt, for example, was growing at 8% at, at before the revolution. The issue is not growth. The issue is the correct type of growth that creates the correct type of jobs for the modern digital economy we live in. Digital, a perfect segue to talk about the fourth industrial revolution we've been hearing about. But first, let's see if there are any questions from the floor. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's dive right in there. Were you afraid, alarmed, optimistic, overjoyed by Professor Schwab's comments and all the, uh, uh, the, the, the examples he gave of, of technology tipping points, robots in the pharmacy, 3D printing coming down, you know, coming our way, brain re research, and, and, and do you think the region will be left behind by this, or do you think it, with the right kind of interventions now, it could be a, a viable player in this new um, ecosystem? Can, can I just take on... Um, uh, when we are talking about the digital economy, we are maybe focusing uh, too much exclusively on the robotics and what this may uh, imply for jobs in the future, which is an important aspect of the whole thing. But let's also talk about the revolution that mobile phones brought and in terms of social inclusion. You have lots of good practices and not from developing countries, emerging economies from Africa, where it shows that how mobile phones can be used for financial inclusion, for access and outreach to rural areas. So we should also look at the opportunities that digital economy can bring to the issue of growth and inclusive growth. And I would write an angle of access to to opportunities and access to finance and others. And I think that an issue that was highlighted, the uh, informal economy, the extent of informal economy, that is very uh, important to find unconventional outreach mechanisms. And uh, digital economy is one way of, of, and I think that the potential is underutilized, how we can make the digital economy work for inclusive parts. You vote for comments. Mohammed first. Um, as I mentioned, we're a very young region. Um, so theoretically speaking, this population should be very ready to adapt and adjust to a new digital economy. With a little bit of investment. Um, I mean, we live in a world where to get a tablet now costs less than 50 bucks when the dream to get a laptop a few years ago was the $100 project and it was seen as outrageous. So access to technology, the pricing of it is dropping. 
governments should really be at the forefront of distributing this technology in the hands of this young population who knows how to break through it to make the most out of it. So in a way, for many regions, the digital economy could be seen as a threat. For me, I hope, I really hope, building on the comments that were just said, that for this region, it should be part of the solution because of the young population that grew up with this technology. And for them, it's not a new revolution. It's part of their daily life. And they know how to function with it. And they know how to unleash its potential with a little bit of support um, uh, that I think private sector and the government should be, uh, be able to provide. So I'm seeing it as part of the solution more so than the problem, frankly, for this region. Hassan, as a business leader, how, uh, how well has the digital economy worked its way into the mainstream economy? Uh, we're still in the early stages in this part of the world. And in many places in the world, I believe, the, the first step was connectivity. And I think over the last three decades, we have managed to create enough connections on networks and the spread of the internet through mobility, particularly that enabled uh, the inclusion of, of, of uh, pretty much the entire world population uh, into one network or another in one way or another. The challenge now is to be able to move to the next step, to actually start using that not just for communication and connectivity, but for transforming uh, the economy and society altogether. And this is what Professor Schwab was effectively alluding to uh, in, in his speech today. I think uh, the, the era of robotics and artificial intelligence and 3D printing is certainly coming. The question is, when will it reach the mass adoption uh, that mobility has reached is probably a different uh, debate point. But what will certainly it will certainly do, it's exactly what computers did. When mainframe computers were exclusive to very large organizations and placed in, in central locations, the PC came and democratized the use of technology and, and brought those corporate capabilities to the individual. The same is now happening at a slightly higher logical level with digital applications. And 3D printing is one example. If 3D printing, well, in my view, it will probably end up bringing manufacturing to a more democratized level. It won't be, manufacturing of the future will not be exclusive to large corporations and big factories. Manufacturing will become accessible to individuals, to smaller groups, small enterprises. That is a revolution by itself. Uh, obviously in the medical field, uh, diagnosis, uh, DNA testing, and the combination with big data will also progress the uh, the longevity of individuals with high productivity. Now that's still probably a bit far off. What we're still challenged with in this part of the world, again, I would divide the region into two or three sub-regions. In some places like the Gulf, you have an advanced usage of technology in governments. In fact, the top two countries in the world in terms of government usage of technology are in the Gulf region. <laughs> but in North Africa and the Levant, we're still way behind in, in that sense. Individuals use technology more than their governments. And there's a long, long way to go in terms of adoption, which I totally agree will bring social inclusion and participative uh, growth in kind of a socially responsible free market economy. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done first on legislation, e-government legislation, as well as uh, technology utilization legislation. Uh, there's a lot to be done on liberalizing the markets, both in the Gulf and the rest of the Middle East region, to attract foreign direct investment and multinational capabilities in deploying infrastructure, in deploying digital applications, and investing in the digital economy, which will then ultimately encourage entrepreneurship in this area, uh, given the talent that exists in this part of the world. Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan are basically centers of excellence for production on the digital side. Uh, and uh, the advancement of uh, digital technology utilization in the Gulf will all complement each other if the right uh, kind of legislative frameworks are in place, regulatory frameworks, and foreign direct investment is attracted in this field. So that the region doesn't miss the digital revolution in, or the digital industrial revolution the way it actually missed the physical industrial revolution mm. uh, in the past. 
a really good point. And when we look at the competitiveness report, of course, and we look at uh, news stories and we, we read about infrastructure projects being used to kickstart uh, industrial growth and development and create jobs, are we getting the balance right here? Obviously, the basic drivers of competitive needs, needs to be uh, paid regard to. But what do you think, Mohammed? Are we getting the balance right between prioritizing how we, how we drive growth and get the right kind of growth, as Azita says? Governments um, all over the world, but specifically in this region, um, um, fancy uh, large mega projects. Um, they're, uh, they're easier to, uh, to, to uh, force uh, through the pipeline. They're easier to achieve. They're easier to measure success. Um, but unfortunately, this is not what this era desires. You know, we're in a world where an app, a uh, few or, or, or several hundred lines of code can be valued worth, um, you know, hundreds of millions of, of, of dollars and generate revenue and generate jobs and advertisement and, and, and really kickstart an economy. But show me one of the education systems that, that have actually decided to teach programming, teach coding. Instead, we're stuck in education systems that teach um, issues that are really not fit for this era and age. And, and, and you know, we just heard about the democratization of the, of, of, of the process. Well, if you can write codes that are worth um, really uh, monetizing, then shouldn't our whole education agenda be catering to that? Shouldn't governments be uh, considering uh, reformulating their approach to investment, to education, um, to address that? Um, it takes a mentality shift, and um, some countries um, uh, have been have been more successful than others in the region at it. But um, here I look really to 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 to, to partnerships uh, from civil society, from businesses, um, the, the governments of, of of many parts of the Arab world and the rest of the world are simply overwhelmed by the demographic bulge they're facing. They're simply trying to absorb the massive numbers that are entering schools. Uh, most of their budgets, uh, if uh, you know, the, they're dwindling as is, but most of their budgets are going to brick and mortar projects for, for, for just absorbing these numbers. But here are the, there are opportunities for, for private sector. Let's take the refugee uh, situation. Um, this is a win-win-win uh, from corporate social responsibility for businesses to start introducing coding at very low cost to refugees to, to, to give them a brighter future rather than them being stuck in this dead end they're in. It's very low cost, it's effective, it gives hope, it might revitalize the region. Um, I'm looking here really at, at not only at governments, I'm looking at the private sector. I'm looking at uh, everybody really to start thinking out of the box when it comes to preparing the region for the coming few decades and to, 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 to stop thinking the old mentality of mega projects. We need infrastructure investments, but we need infrastructure investments in, 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 in a digital, soft coding way as well, Oliver. Soft infrastructure as well as hard infrastructure. Yes. Azita, we have precious little time left, but give us your, your priority. What would you most like to see achieved in the next 12 months? Let me go to what is the mantra of this uh, GAC summit, and that is public-private cooperation. And I want to emphasize that in the MENA region, public-private cooperation actually is highly underutilized, and there is a big potential to go in a systematic way. And I will want to give three concrete examples. One, uh, the percentage of uh, public budget which is invested in research and development, manufacturing, economic transformation, um, to really have those kinds of uh, research and development embedded in the economies rather than imported. I think there is a huge potential there. And that is about uh, public budget encouraging uh, industry-based research and development. I think that's one element. The second uh, very concrete example and joins what uh, we were saying about the education system, it's a systematic approach to bringing the world of education and the world of labor markets uh, together uh, in designing some of the, some parts of the curricula in having the training and skill system produce for the um, uh, labor market needs, but not immediate needs, also future uh, out, uh, outlook. And let me give an example that has been tried and tested in many countries, uh, the apprenticeship system, quality apprenticeship systems, where it is 
the investment is done by mainly employers, the private sector, the public authorities put the regulating framework, and obviously uh, the rights of young people because these are young people uh, employed uh, together with school-based training, that gives results immediately and it is not an investment for social uh, CSR type of issues, but it is an investment because it brings back profit and money for the private sector. But it has to be structured. It, has, it is not just a project, one, one scheme. And there have been uh, several wrong startups on this in the region, but uh, that is a huge potential for private-public uh, cooperation. And the third um, concrete example I want to give is also the issue of SMEs and informal economy. There, too, there is a, a, a big scope of um, encouraging transition to formal economy, but from both aspects of improving the productivity, improving their access to financial inclusion, and there is an agenda both for public policies, but also the, the private sector uh, to have a more level playing field for small, medium enterprises. Uh, and there, the big um, firms or companies have a, a, a major role on mind, change of mindset to, to operate, to include or to see as part of their, the private sector development, this uh, level playing field for medium, uh, small and medium economy. Hassan, very briefly, what's your, what's on your wish list for 2016? My, uh, on my wish list is uh, for each country in the region to put uh, as a top uh, priority uh, its reform agenda item uh, with the objective of regaining or building the trust of the public in, in the government uh, by taking concrete rather than populist actions, concrete actions to stabilize if it's a country that has instability, uh, to create more transparency, uh, embrace uh, openness to international trade and foreign direct investments, uh, which I believe will be the uh, largest sources of economic stability uh, and capabilities development um, in terms of training and talent development, um, as well as uh, job creation. So, and these, in, in my view, are uh, extremely important and immediate priorities that should be put on the decision makers agenda. Thank you all. So, so it gives me a busy year ahead. We've run out of time, which is a shame because we could have gone for much longer, but that's the nature of this meeting. Everybody's got places to be very, very soon. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today here in the Media Briefing Centre. Also, thank you for watching online. Thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, on the panel here. It's been a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank this you. session is now over. <laughs>